of high or low recruitment events. Also, the risk table could help, help be used to inform management uncertainty or the, the PSTAR buffer that could lead to changes in harvest policy. Uh, Corey Green mentioned that the risk table help could help uh, could lead to changes in harvest control rules. Um, and Tommy mentioned it might be useful in, in, in within in-season adjustments. Stock assessment prior to, prioritization, and a lot of folks thought that the risk table approach could be useful um, to assess the prior, prior, prioritizing uh, stock assessments, particularly for the ground fish, ground fish, stock, ground fish stocks. Um, other ideas that came up were that it could be useful in terms of spatial allocations, uh, and may also provide um, support for comment letters from the council to other agencies or entities. And so if we have time today, we could revisit these ideas with, with the other um, the new folks who are on the call today, particularly the stock assessment scientists. So now I'll just step through the, the risk table. So we're all sort of on the same page about our discussion today in terms of revising this table. Uh, the Alaska Center originally had, uh, I think, four different levels um, of, of the four different tiers on the left, the left column. So, and they started from level two to level five. So they had normal, uh, substantially increased concerns, major concerns, and extreme concerns. They decided that four levels was uh, too many, and so they reduced that to three levels. So they had level two through four. The Pacific Fisheries Management Council. One of their main comments when we brought this. Um, uh, idea to them was that we need we should include a, a, another level that included what we have here for now for level one is that um, the, the conditions of the stock or species or complexes are above or better than normal. So I've included that one here. And then we have uh, several different uh, columns for considerations. The first here shown here is the assessment related considerations. Uh, and these are those that are associated with an increase in uncertainty of the stock assessment models that could be re related to data inputs, model fits and model performance or estimation uncertainty. Um, and we also included another one here that Kiva brought up was about data conflicts where once one set of data might be telling you something different from another set of data that goes into the assessments. Also with the population dynamics considerations column here, this um, uh, column is to sort of capture information about the biomass trend, whether it's decreasing or increasing uh, to capture information about recruitment or about abrupt changes in stock abundance. And then the environmental considerations um, relate to um, changes or uh, changes in the ecosystem indicators, for example, changes in um, predation or competition um, or, or, um, or prey abundance, as well as uh, ecosystem productivity or other ecosystem processes. One of the newer uh, columns that were added to, to the table from the Alaska Fishery Science Center was also this fishery performance column, which is uh, reflective of, as reflective of the stock. So this could be uh, showing, for example, contrasting patterns from the stock biomass trend, uh, unusual spatial patterns of fishing, changes in the duration of fishery, open, fishery openings, for example. And we also, um, just through the EWG, we had a different uh, added a new column that would try to capture the social or economical, economic value to de de dependent communities. And so one thing we wanted to discuss today, um, in addition to sort of the different, different levels or tiers uh, and the classifications is, sort of, is this number of columns that we have here um, and whether we want to keep, for example, the fishery performance column or the social and economical value, economic value to dependent uh, communities column or how we can adjust those columns uh, better to sort of tune, up, tune what we want to tune the table to the California Current and the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And whether we, whether this type of information might be better here in the risk table or when we're uh, in the species selection table that we, we talked about on Monday. So some of the discussion points for this morning uh, include uh, how should we revise the risk table so that's better tuned to the California Current. For example, I just mentioned uh, whether we include the fishery performance uh, columns and the fishery dependent community columns. Um, also, uh, Jamil brought up a couple of great questions recently about uh, can we, how can we incorporate fishermen observations into the risk classification? Could that be within that fishery performance column or would that look different? Also, a couple of questions that came up um, in our discussions from Monday was that we, can we present the information in the risk table in a different way so that it captures ecosystem conditions during specific life stages, uh, particularly if we don't know when recruitment levels are set. Um, another question uh, from Jamil was, can we summarize information across stocks that get the, uh, the ecosystem for uh, initiative um, 
ecosystem initiative for treatment to provide a more holistic evaluation of ecosystem conditions that could then feed back to affect harvest levels. And I'm wondering with Jamil too, if that could help feed back to harvest levels for data, data poor stocks. And then finally, um, a, a final question could be, what would the internal review of risk tables look like? For example, if they're going to be, they're, they're going to impact um, policy decisions or policy making, uh, then it will, it will require some sort of internal review. So with that, I'd like to first ask if there are any questions about anything I've already presented, um, or if anyone has any initial uh, thoughts about um, the risk table that they would like to share. So uh, I had to remind myself, and I'll do it now, that if you want to raise your hand, you go to the little reactions button, which has a sort of smiley face and a plus sign on it, and you raise your blue hand um, in that bar. So if people want to raise their hands to chat, and then, um, so Mary, I really appreciated on Monday the Stephanie's a suggestion and comment about, um, you know, you can get too far into the weeds in thinking that there are different levels of concern and, um, you know, reading the difference between major concern and extreme concern um, for all intents and purposes, they're the same thing. So I, I just wanted to uh, speak in favor of not having more than these you know, in, including, of course, what the council, what our council said for having a sort of more positive outlook in level one, but then um, only having these two increased and major concern levels uh, for the negative outlook. And then I'll just lower my hand and see if other people have any comments or questions. So, Yvonne, you're saying to keep level one and then level three and level four? Those three three levels. Yes, yes. Okay. So I just um, just commenting, agreeing that we don't need that that level five. Yep. Yes, and that's the level five. The Alaska Center started with that, and then they they eventually removed it because for the same reasons that you're that you brought up. Yeah, and then uh, Corey Niles has raised his blue hand. Go ahead, Corey. It, yeah. Thanks, Mary. Thank, well, um, minor point, but just well, one level one. I don't know what why you need above or better, why you need both those adjectives, but level four can always be major or greater, but I was gonna, um, greater than kind of thing. Um, but I was wondering if Andrew would be willing, and Andrew Thompson, he put a thing in a message in the chat about why this might be helpful for Sardine. And I guess I thought it might be helpful, at least for some of us, like how, how walking through how, how it would be helpful. Do you have more thoughts there, Andrew? Yeah, yeah, totally. So um, for sardine, there's sort of a hard and fast temperature barrier where if the temperature drops below a certain point, then you kind of have a break point in the ABC for sardine. But it's been shown that like that temperature is, that's way too simplistic of a, um, variable to give you any guidance about what's going on with the sardines or with the stock dynamics in the future. So, so right now there's one variable that has a big impact on ABC, but I think that having a more holistic perspective when you consider multiple factors that are articulated in a risk table like this would be a lot more useful for a realistic um, harvest control for, for sardines. This helps, in other words, I think that this helps articulate that one variable typically isn't <clears throat> informative enough to make such big decisions in terms of ABC for a stock. It's, it's more nuanced. The things that cause the populations to increase or decrease are much more nuanced than the single temperature variable. And this is a good opportunity to articulate those sorts of um, potential important variables that might be interacting with one another and given us a more holistic view of what we do and we don't know about 
the factors that are impacting the stock. Great, thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Does anyone from the groundfish team have any comments about the risk table, some of these levels and what I've presented here so far? Any changes you would make to this or, um, you know, getting at some of those questions also about uh, including fishermen, fishermen information in the table. Go ahead, Elliot. And I, I was just going to jump. Oh, sorry. I was going to jump in and just say for the fishery performance. One thing that came about from Steph's Zaydor's presentation was that they were using, I think, ESPs for that. But I did want to mention, I think our CCIA, CCIEA ecosystem status report is pretty robust on that, um, you know, on the fishery performance metric. So I think we could include that without too much additional work. But if you said Jamil has his hand up too, he may have thoughts. Go ahead, Jamil. I was going to comment on something else. Um, I, I just wanted to like make the observation that our charge was to think about how to include climate and ecosystem information into the harvest setting process. And this risk classification table actually is more than that. It's incorporating uh, a risk classification table that has you know, columns like assessment related considerations, pop die considerations, fishery performance and social and economic value. And and that middle column seems to be the one that was initially the charge. So I just wanted to like make that observation um, and, and see if that stimulates any discussion around whether we want to be broadening to capture all of these different components, including those related to sort of the pop die and assessment model. Um, and and by way of like advancing that discussion, I would say in, in this approach, the climate and ecosystem, ecosystem information is one fifth of the set of considerations that contribute to a level one through five score. And, and that may be desirable and it may not be, but it's something that we should be intentional about. Great, thank you, Jamil. Uh, I think Whitney Roberts was next. And then we go to John Field and then Corey. Thanks. Yeah, just making sure you can hear me. Yep, can hear you. Okay, great. Um, thinking about that farthest column to the right, the social or economic value to dependent communities. Um, in this scenario, how are we defining communities? Um, if that's not already clear, it might be good to clarify that for consistency across species and um, stock assessments. Great, thanks. Yvonne, I don't know if you want to jump in here on that question. Uh, Yvonne, well, go ahead. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, so thank you. I had been the one to propose that. And um, and then subsequently, as Mary noted, Jamil had commented uh, internally, well, maybe this should be more part of the um, species selection criteria. So, um, and in that way, because I do agree with Jamil that we're getting to the point where we're getting so many different things in. I think what we want to do is start with big tables and big, you know, broad ideas uh, and maybe some imprecision and then narrow down to smaller tables and more precision by the time we get it into the council. So, um, so I was definitely moved by that. And uh, I think that question of whether we take up which species we take up next uh, is more important to consider in the species selection table. So unless there are other people who are really strong on needing to have that stuff in the right-hand column in the risk classification table, I think we should move it earlier in the process. Um, it, bearing in mind that I think we all know that um, we're gonna do Chinook salmon no matter what, so. <laughs> Great, thanks, Yvonne. John, do you want to hop on? Sure, I'll hop on. Can you all hear me? Yep. 
Great. Um, I, I think I agree quite a bit with Jamil and Yvonne about uh, this. I was going to um, add that if you were considering including these or having them early in the process, somewhere in the mix, perhaps in fishery performance, might be kind of regional concentration of catch as well. I know this is something that has been presented both in the CCIA and in some of the assessments. Um, you know, there, there's increasingly some uh, heterogeneity in, in where catches of many species are landed. For coastwide stocks, catches might be concentrated in one region or the other, and, and that could lead to both ecosystem and assessment concerns. So that might be something to flag somewhere in the process. Um, otherwise, I'm agreeing that this is this is a great start. Thanks, John. Corey, do you want to unmute? Yeah, thanks, Mary. Um, yes, first, I, I had a similar thought to Jamil when reading through this last week. Um, yeah, our focus was supposed to be on the central column, but yeah, I guess I'm just trying to run through these rows and columns and in, in, in scenarios we've seen in the past. Um, and like, yeah, how do you weight one against the other? I'm thinking maybe of, you know, before we had an anchovy assessment framework, you know, we were, we had a situation where, you know, we had a index of abundance that was looked like it, the stock was crashing, but then, you know, on the, on the fishery side, they were saying, you know, they were seeing bigger schools than they'd ever seen. Um, so in that situation, would this really help? Um, yeah, I guess on the fishery performance, I'm wondering how that would factor in. I think John brings up the good, the local depletion concern type thing, but I think an interesting example of that was, um, I don't really follow halibut, but we'll read or, or listen to the stock assessment presentations. And with this year, or even maybe the past year too, was uh, interesting. If you look at what they report, the reference points that the stock is above target, um, and yet uh, they were expressing a lot of concern with the stock because they've never seen CPU so low in certain parts of the fishery. I'm going to get the details wrong. So that was it's one example I can think of where, um, and I think it has something weird to do with their deni the way they do the, their B0, but if you just looked at the face value on the assessment results, it looks like everything should be okay, but the fishery performance and other things were um, pointing pointing to concern. So, long way of saying, yeah, I'm, I'm, it's uh, not. I don't have a great vision of how this would actually play out in with these species. But yeah, it's an interesting start for sure. Great, thanks, Corey. Any other initial reactions at this point? Well, one of the questions we also had was about uh, whether we could present the information a different way so that it captures ecosystem conditions during specific life stages. Um, I know we had a discussion about that on Monday a bit. Uh, Andrew Thompson, I think you, you chimed in a bit there as well. Uh, I wondered if we wanted to talk a little bit more about that today with respect to the risk table. If anyone wanted to, to comment on that. Go ahead, Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, so I think that, like, I guess what I'm thinking is that we would almost have a breakout, like, table coming out of the environmental slash ecosystem considerations where we go into those sorts of things into more detail to help support what comes into this. If we have a risk table like this, then the information that I think we're charged, like, like Jamil said, we're charged now with coming up with a detailed ecosystem slash environmental considerations um, assessment, risk assessment, I guess. And I think that that would probably be separate from this one, which includes additional factors, but it might feed into this one. Um, and then I think the reason that we're so excited about like going after the trolley saw and um, others is because we do have good information at this time about what um, factors might influence various life stages and how important that might be to the ultimate recruitment and future population dynamics. 
So I think that the way that I'm seeing all this is that that's what we're going to be trying to get after in the next few months is, is that component of it. And then that might help supplement or feed into this more broad that is also important because it has other things in there that are, you know, need to be considered. Great. Yes, that makes makes sense to me for sure. Does anyone else have any thoughts about that? Agree, disagree? Uh, so I, I just want to see, I'm, I'm looking at that. I don't disagree. I'm looking at that column and I'm just trying to think about maybe what that comment from Andrew means is that we need to revise the um, revise the text under that third column so that it's clear that um, that we're thinking about the effects of the environment on the different life stages. Uh, Jessica, maybe you have some wisdom for us. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing of of kind of clarifying what's considered of some indicators show, you know, does that consider indicators from multiple life stages, like putting some classifications to some of these um, in column three, some of these terms of some multiple, like what would check the box there? So like a criteria for what we're considering would take you from one level to the next. Is it multiple different indicators or indicators across life stages, I think we can come up maybe with this idea of adding this breakout table, really what that breakout table is, is a criteria list of how many indicators would warrant change or how many indicators in the different life stages. So we could kind of clarify it there. I guess that's what I was thinking as a breakout would be more of the clarification of what we're discussing taking you from one level to the next. Thanks, Jessica. I will say that um, within, I was looking at one of the Gulf of Alaska assessments, I think it was for Pollock or PCOT, and when they present the risk tables, they do have, when they present each of the, the column headers, for example, they do spell out a bit more in description what the what the different uh, considerations are for those particular categories. Um, so it does provide some detail, doesn't go into that level of detail, but um, that's somewhere where we could spell out a little bit more of the, sort of the, some of the ideas that, that Andrew was mentioning as well as Yvonne. It could be one place for it. Uh, Jessica, you still have your hand up. I don't know if you have a follow up, but if not, then uh, Jamil is up next. Legacy hands are everywhere. Um, I was just, I, I'm supportive of the life history based approach. It makes a lot of sense to me and it helps us think mechanistically a bit more about wait, what's happening with the environment or with other species at different life stages. I am wondering if we were to retain all the columns or at least the pop die column here, if these life history considerations could be integrated into the pop die column um, as well or separately. And if we wanna sort of think think through that and, and as Andrew suggested, it might take uh, deeper discussion to sort it all. Good idea. All right, so let's see. So what does the group think about that? That to me, and I'm not, you know, not a scientist, but I really like that idea of making the life history stages and discussion. Maybe what we do is we we broaden out some of the discussions under those two columns of population dynamics and environmental slash ecosystem considerations, because the assessment related considerations will hopefully, this is supposed to be attached to the stock assessment will be 
uh, you know, evident in the stock assessment. Okay, I see Tim Copeland and Nick Tolomieri agree. And then Kit Dahl in the chat says, Stephanie mentions there's additional narrative paragraphs. Okay, all right. Thanks, Kit. We should look at those later. All right, so what do we have for hands? Melissa uh, Halter. Melissa? Hey, everyone. It's going to put my Pacific Coast hat back on for a few minutes. Um, I was thinking about what the life stage discussion and the assessments essentially treat, well, they don't have a whole lot of detail in the early life history um, box. It's kind of a black box, right? We model with recruitment and some stuff happens and we, we estimate recruitment using other data. It almost seems like if you want to go down the path of early life history stage information, you're adding another column that sits someplace in between the stock assessments and the and the broader ecosystem uh, column for what it's worth. So uh, I'll just put that out there and I support using early life history information where you have it, um, unsurprisingly, given the previous work for petroleum sable fish. Go ahead, Andrew. Thanks, Yvonne. So I think that one really good thing about this exercise is going to be for us to be creating a template of the types of things that need to be studied for species that don't have this information already. So starting with sable fish and petrali sole, like we can lean on some of the really awesome work that Nick has done, um, which has identified, you know, potential bottleneck, potential points in the life history of a species of these species that seem to be um, particularly important for governing their future population dynamics and fully realizing that a lot of the species that are being assessed don't have that type of information. But this could be a really good opportunity for us to sort of say, hey, this is where the gaps of knowledge lie. So if there's funding to, you know, do something or other, this would be a good use of funds to fill in these gaps for the species that need it. So that's why, like yesterday, that's why I was saying that I think that um, the species that we choose initially are the ones where we have a good chance of success to complete this exercise, because this will sort of hopefully, you know, provide guidance for future research that can help fill in these gaps for other species that don't have this information at the ready. Thank you, Andrew. Yeah, maybe that that also brings up back to Melissa's point or previous discussion about having calling out calling out the life history the different stages too much might not be a great idea if if a lot of the species aren't going to have that type of information as well. So Melissa, did you have a follow up? Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry, but Barry, I think that that's a really good point. But I think that, you know, it's important to identify, even though they don't have it now, this is like what we need to do to go out and get it to better understand what's going on. Um, so I think that's an important part of this too. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I don't see any hands. I did um, wanna check and see Kelly Johnson, uh, are you comfortable with my responses to your question? What is meant by attached to the assessment? I, I wanted to uh, sort of open that out a bit so that we don't panic the stock assessment authors on this call. Um, we are not at all intending to hold up or cause confusion for the stock assessment process, at least this year. <laughs> um, uh, we're just, going to provide these tables as a pilot for the council and see what they think and whether this is something they might want to have as part of their um, sort of uh, front information in the stock assessment going forward. And I think that, if I already said this in the chat, that for right now it seems like what's happening in Alaska is they're just 
putting these risk assessment tables sort of towards the beginning of the in the introductory text of the stock assessment. So <laughs> Kelly, you can you can turn your microphone on and speak up. Uh, I don't know what the long term goal would be. I think the long term goal uh, would ultimately be to see if we could um, incorporate some ecosystem and environmental and climate information into stock assessments where that is warranted. And as you probably know from working on sable fish, there's been a lot of testing on that, but it's going to take a while before we get to that level. Okay, thanks. That's helpful. And then just for a bit of context, I also work on Pacific Hake and we're, I think, at the point where we reach out ahead of time to economists and uh, environmental scientists, and then they try to get data or paragraphs to us prior to submitting the assessment. And we've successfully done that with Aaron Steiner regarding the economics aspect of Pacific Cake, where the data, the way that the data are collected, it, it falls within our timing and works well. But that's slightly more difficult with the ecosystem data and what Michael Malik has done, because it's difficult to get that timing with the assessment timing. And so that's um, why I'm asking and just trying to think ahead in that context, not because I worry about making a 250 page document, a 251 page document, or any of those problems. I mean, they're already big and long and what does it matter if it's a little bit bigger? That's not the problem. The problem more comes down to timing. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Um, so, uh, we're trying, we're trying to sort of proceed very carefully so that we take all of those timing bits and pieces into account. So appreciate you mentioning them. Um, one of the interesting things that I heard, uh, Stephanie say was that working on the risk tables has encouraged the Alaska Fishery Science Center ecosystem scientists to work directly with the Alaska Fishery Science Center stock assessment scientists. And um, <laughs> it's it's a, sometimes frustrating that it might take a council process to do that, but I'm glad to hear that you're already doing that in Hague. Um, Melissa, I don't mean to call you out, but I'm going to call you out just because you now you, know, you have a lot of experience with the California current and now also the Alaska uh, systems and Alaska Fisheries Science Center. And I'm wondering if you have any perspective, you know, knowing both systems and you know how we how the about these tables and how they might be tuned better to the California current or any other sort of perspectives on this process that might be useful for us. Well, I. You, you're welcome to call me out. That's totally fine. Um, <laughs> I know that this process is well received by the North Pacific Council. I have not yet been through the North Pacific Council's assessment process that will happen in the fall. So I don't have any like on the ground insider knowledge. I think Steph probably gave you the best um, overview. I do know that there's a lot of dialogue between the um, the assessors and the, the folks essentially doing the equivalent of the IEA type work uh, over here. Um, but I haven't actually seen the discussion in the council about how these are used. And there's a difference here I, between the North Pacific and the Pacific, which is that I think in the North Pacific, the authors make the recommendation. And in the Pacific Council, really, it's the SSC and the managers that make the recommendation to the council. And that's a pretty big difference. Um, I, if you talk to me in the end of December, I may have something different to say. <laughs> I think that, yeah, anyways, tailoring this for the Pacific Council to what works best for you all is a good thing. Um, I do like fewer categories rather than more kind of with fine gradation. And I think Jamil's question about do we want to include all of these columns is a good one. Um, 
and I would I would go back to what the council requested and what they want. You can always add later, but once you start doing something, it's pretty hard to to drop items sometimes. Go ahead, Ivan. Thank you, Melissa. To to Melissa's comment, um, I, I was going to suggest that we um, think about going back to the first, just the first three columns. Um, remove fishery performance for now, uh, because I'm not sure what all went into that, and um, we may already have that information in some of our. It's one of the other sets of columns. So, so start with just assessment related considerations, population dynamics, expand population dynamics so that we make sure we're thinking about the different life history stages and then environmental and ecosystem considerations as our third column. Cause um, I admire and respect the Alaskans, but they do tend to add a lot of stuff a lot of the time. So I'll just leave it at that. Yvonne, I had one comment to dropping fishery performance, which I think is a reasonable choice. And that is, if you're thinking of fishery performance as, you know, the, the stock or the fishery able to take the full catch, um, there is a table in the executive summary of all of the stock assessments that provides that information. So you can see the OFL, the ABC, and what was actually landed now. I'm sure we could all think of more things for fishery performance, um, but there is a little bit of information currently in the stock assessment. Corey and, and Elliot and Jamil. Yeah, thanks, maybe just briefly, I guess if, if the fishery performance I was seeing that as a place yeah not i'm not having strong feelings still absorbing the stuff but where we, we often hear comments about assessments not reflecting experience on the water of, of of the fishery so i mean that's where else would you record that kind of um concern you know and how the being one where the, the experience in the water is bad. We've heard lots of cases where we they, people think it's better than the assessment says. So, but with where else would we put that? And then, I guess on the social economic value, I'm wondering what we what we do with that one as well. Um, but I'll I'll pause there. Leave it the fisher performance comment. Okay, Elliot. Yeah, I was just going to quickly actually um, second the idea of dropping the last two columns at this stage. I, I thought that was really helpful information for Melissa about the various fishery performance indicators, or I guess technically OFL and ABC as part of the stock assessment. So I, I wonder if that's just something we could point to rather than trying to reinvent a wheel, unless there are additional things we would want to record beyond that. But again, I think that could be done in a, in a potential paragraph rather than necessarily a category here. Um, and starting simple seems best. Okay. Great, thank you. And Jamil? Thanks, yeah, I was going to respond to the idea of dropping the right two columns and just say that for those that weren't here on Monday, when we discussed the idea of developing a framework for selecting which species to give the initiative for treatment, um, we, we discussed a number of different criteria. And I think both fishery performance and the sort of value to communities could be captured there and address uh, Corey's point that there are elements of fishery performance not captured by the alphabet soup that Mel Melissa referred to in the front of the assessments, like uh, local depletion issues that that John brought up, or or you know spatial differences um, in fishery performance, uh, market factors, who knows what. Um, and similarly on the community side, and and 
I guess what I'm suggesting is like concern around fishery performance and or for dependent communities could elevate the need for the initiative for treatment for a particular species if we were to decide to go that direction. Thanks, Jamil. Andrew, do you want to go and then Michelle Conrad can follow you? Yeah, thanks, Mary. I think that you know, Mullen it all right. I think that Elliot and Jamil are right that probably we should take out at least the far right column. But as far as the far right column goes, just for clarification, um, would the social or economic value to dependent communities, would that mean that if a species, say a salmon, is you know, culturally valuable, that you would allow a higher take than you would otherwise? Is that sort of the what that's there to imply? Think, yeah, so my original thinking was just, um, I, I, I think I had it in the wrong table. <laughs> I, I, I think the table where we choose which species to do next is the right place for it because uh, we want to make sure that we, you know, if that's something the council wants to do is pay extra attention to those species, then we have a place for them to do so. Um, and that was, it was difficult to figure out what the different levels would be like. You're right. Do we want to have a higher take or, or I don't know. So, or do we want to worry more about, uh, you know, long term health of the stock? Yeah, I mean, my thought is that we want to allow, you know, communities to take as much as they possibly can without jeopardizing the capacity to do so in the future. So, I don't know about allowing more than what you think they could possibly do without harming the stocks because they're culturally important. Sure. Maybe we can yeah, talk about this more when we revisit the species selections table. Um, it looks like Michelle Conrad has her hand up and then uh, Josh Lindsay. And then Corey and Tim. Thanks, Mary. Can you hear me? Go ahead, Michelle. Great. Um, I appreciate yep. the discussion and I think all good uh, questions relative to fishery performance and social and economic value. What's, um, what's done now, what's included in the assessment. And I think uh, what's kind of inherent in the discussion is where you're going to get the information, who's going to complete that column in the table and determine the level, and then also um, what's going to be the communication tool to the council and the stakeholders in public. And so what I like about including the columns right now is I think it gives a, a snapshot for the council um, as they kind of consider the risk uh, of their decision, whether that's setting a harvest level or setting a buffer or, you know, just whether or not they should do something different than just what the assessment is saying that they should do. Um, this kind of gives a, an overall picture of all of the things that they're considering. So it's not just environmental ecosystem considerations or Right, that they're also considering the fisheries performance and the social and economic value. So it's more of like a communication tool to help them with their decision making and with the broader stakeholders and public about what all was considered in their risk assessment. So um, I guess I, I would encourage separating, you know, the thinking of who completes this column and where the information comes from, from what's the best communication tool at the end to facilitate the decision making. Thanks. Yeah, great, good points. Thank you. Josh, go ahead. Josh, we can't hear you. I don't know if you're still muted. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, I, mean, I think Michelle's comment speaks to sort of some of the things you laid out in the first area about still figuring out how we're going to use this, which may then drive some of the decisions on, on the columns. Um, and that's a discussion we still need to have to some degree. Um, and then just speaking to some of the previous conversations, I'm, I'm comfortable also removing the last two columns for now. I, I do think the fishery performance one, there's some interesting things there that some of our fisheries have greater year to year variability related to that. That could be more of a driver that we want to look at versus a longer term indicator that we need to move something into whether or not we need to do a risk table, which might take multiple years sort of thing. So I think it's okay to move for now, but I would keep it closer on the back burner than maybe the social one for, for the purposes of the risk table. Um, and then I guess on the, similarly on the, the first column, um, in yesterday's presentation, it was noted that that's really to capture things not captured in the assessment model. And so I'd be curious if there's any discussion on we feel like we can do that in our current process. Is that a valuable one for our current process of how we do, say, sigma and tiers? Is it duplicative? Uh, maybe some more thinking on that one as well in terms of maybe narrowing the scope. Thanks, Josh. I think that's a great question. I had a similar thought about, uh, yeah, how that that stock assessment uh, column, how that might you know, might have to change that based on. Um, the, the process for the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Um, I don't know if we can maybe open that up for discussion, um, but first I think Corey has a comment and then Tim. Yeah, I guess the th thought um, on the on the social economic, I guess, you know, it's a, it, when going back to Andrew saying, you know, it is a, a long-term, short-term consideration and you could, Talk about you know both the way the consequence you know risk is probability times consequence if the consequences are high I mean but I guess one so well, skipping to my point I think one thing um, and this might go into the selection criteria is really is this going to be useful for stocks where catch is well below the ABC level um, and we've had P star discussions. Or something like mackerel, where it seems like a one in twenty chance that if that that catch will get anywhere near the ABC in a given year. So, just thought there maybe maybe that'll be should be part of our selection criteria is like, what is the fishery then? You know, what's the likelihood that the fishery actually will even get close to the ABC? And do we really need to worry about it? The risk. Great, thanks, Corey. Tim. Oh, uh, I'm not in my office, so I hope this is coming through fine. Yep, I can hear I, you and see I kinda, you. Okay, I, I kind of want to pull this back to to what Jamil was saying earlier about what's the central mission here, which is the middle column, right? And and I think it might be useful to think about <clears throat> uh, how. The, you know, the table is kind of a linked series of questions with, that kind of tear off of, of the ecosystem and environmental aspects. And so what, you know, what are, what are the things of concern here? How are they related to both population dynamics of the stock, at least in a way that's not captured by the stock assessment model? But I mean, the, the fishery performance has got to be the other half of that. I think you need to keep both of those. Um, and, and and I I think it's useful to say it may be in both of those that whether this is a, a mechanistic hypothesis that we're linking this parameter to this population dynamic aspect or whether it's just an empirical relationship that we're not really sure what the mechanism is. Um, so th those are my thoughts at this point. Great, thank you, Tim. Um, Yvonne, I'm noticing it's 10 o'clock now. What would you like to do at this point? Would you like to um, wrap up? Yeah, um, I think, um, yeah, I think we just say thank you to everyone. Um, we've had a, this is really helpful to have this conversation. Um, and 
uh, I think, you know, we've gone from, it's always got good to go from, well, not quite sure what we're, what we need to present in front of the council to much more clear on what we're going to share in front of the council. And, um, to that end, I would just say that, um, although the council has asked us to come to them in June for an update, they're not making any decisions on this in June, at least that's my understanding. So our main focus is going to be the September meeting. So, so those of you who are on the call, um, you should have um, multiple different opportunities to think about and, um, you know, offer comments and ideas for this process. Okay. Thank you so much, Mary, for taking us through that. And uh, do you have any final thoughts you want to share? Um, I just want to thank everyone for their input. I think this was a was a great discussion. And thank you for your input today and on Monday, and also folks who've been I've been emailing with about this as well. Really appreciate your feedback. Okay, uh, I think we're gonna let's see. Yours truly needs to spend a little time shifting around tabs here, but because um, I was not as well prepared as Mary. Where do we need to go? Well, to distract so, you, Yvonne. Go ahead. Are we having, I, I'm guessing not, we're not, are we having any breaks? Oh, uh, well, I suppose we could do a quick break. It's 10.02, and that would give me a chance to get the Petroli Sol risk evaluation table up. And um, let's see, let's come back at, let's do five minutes and come back at 10.07. Is that acceptable? Yes. Sounds okay, good. thanks.
I think. So, Jamil, would you mind muting? Because I think you're getting a lot of chats, G chats. To be honest, Yvonne, I'm doing that just to mess with him. So, I apologize. Great, Elliot. Okay. <laughs> All right, what, uh, let's see. So we are now dealing with a trolley soul and uh, I want to add, let's see, not that we're gonna do a deep dive, but just to make sure that we have them available to the folks on the call. The, um, on March 20th, there was a pre-assessment workshop for Petrali Soul. And here is a link to the report out from that workshop. And here is the last Petrali Soul assessment. And I just want to check and see uh, if either Vlada Gertseva or Ian Taylor are on the line. I see Ian. We both here. Oh, okay, good. And thanks, Vlada. The um, the names are in uh, alphabetical order by first name, so people like you and I are always at the end of the list. <laughs> okay. So I think what I should do is um, I should share my screen and. That way, and if when I'm doing that, if there are hands raised, if people could help me out in noticing those, because it's sometimes I've got a tiny screen. Oh, here we go. All right. Okay. So, uh, and let me enlarge this for everyone so we can see it. So, this first page is uh, what the initial Gulf of Alaska Pollock risk evaluation table look like. <clears throat> and so you can see from that that they took they took those three columns from the um, risk assessment table, so assessment related considerations, population dynamics, and environmental slash ecosystem considerations. <clears throat> And then they looked specifically at the Gulf of Alaska Pollock stock, and they set the level for that stock. Um, so the level of concern for that stock based on information about, you know, the quality of the data in the stock assessment, what's going on with population dynamics in the assessment, electric, different life history characteristics. And then also you can see on the right-hand side um, it, that this was taking place um, at a time of a, a marine heat wave and weak El Nino, which particularly affected Pollock. So, so this is how they were looking at Pollock. And what we're gonna try to do today, and Nick, are you still on Nick Tolomieri? Uh, if you are, okay, thanks, Nick. Sorry. Like I said, I can't see everyone when I'm switching back and forth, yep. but, um, so Nick Tolomieri, Melissa Haltuk, Mike J. Cox, and, uh, who is your fourth author from Southwest Center? Wait, um, we had, he from yes. the UW. yeah, right, right, right. Okay. So then we had, um, had two papers, one for petroleum soul and one for sable fish that really, um, that really dug into the different, and please correct me, Nick and Melissa, um, really dug into the different life history stages of each of the species and asked, okay, what, what indicators, what variables do we have? Do they show any, um, any effect on these different life history stages in a way that, that is measurable and that might be useful to thinking about the effects of the environment on this species. So it was a deep dive for each species. Um, and do you want to say that better than I did, Nick? Okay. And so, uh, so it was pretty intense. Um, and 
you can imagine that when we've got more than 100 species on our coast, like the idea of doing that, and then, you know, however many salmon stocks that we have, pretty crazy. And uh, we don't necessarily want this initiative to last for 100 years. So, <laughs> but it does give us a great baseline for starting off with petrali and sable fish. And so, um, so at any rate, with that, I'm going to just scroll down and... Oh, thank you. So Mary added what this sort of looked like in the stock assessment and, or as I said earlier, stapled to the stock assessment. Uh, and what they did was, this was, oh gosh, this was 2022 and the table that I showed you was from 2020. And in 2022, they had no increased concerns under any of these different columns. And the conclusion was that the ABC be the maximum permissible uh, increase from the, the prior ABC um, based on environmental considerations being, um, being uh, less than they had less concern than they had previously. If you recall, Stephanie talking about this on Monday, they had a lot of concerns for a lot of different species coming out of the marine heat wave. And so in cooler years or years without that anomaly, um, it, was, it was less of an issue for them. So let's move down to Petrali Sol. And uh, so we are in blank. Uh, we have a completely blank table, which I'm sure is intimidating, at least it is to me. Let's see, let's go to 125%. And we're just getting started on the assessment. We had the pre-assessment workshop. And so I will ask uh, Vlada and Ian, uh, what are some of the thoughts that you might have on how the on the challenges with the assessment? Is it like easy peasy, it's gonna go smoothly and it's just a matter of getting the right numbers in the right places? Or, uh, you know, do you have some data challenges you might wanna talk about? And bear in mind, all of this is draft and we can modify it later. So what do you, what do you, is that a terrible way of asking that question? No, it's fine. <laughs> Vlada, do you wanna speak first or should I? Go ahead. Okay. And Vlad and I are actually in adjacent offices here at Northwest Center right now, um, so you might hear some <laughs> echo, and if so, we can close our doors. Um, uh, you know, on the spectrum of, uh, every assessment has complications, but on the spectrum of, of easy peasy to lots of issues, Petrali seems to be definitely closer to the easy peasy end of things. Um, you know, that there's, uh, it's focused on commercial fisheries, so there's not the extra complexity of, you know, recreational data. Um, in the past, the biggest sort of source of debate and conflict has been, um, I think like 10, 12 years ago, uh, um, different trends in commercial CPUE versus um, surveys. Uh, in general, the that, that was sort of when our survey time series was quite short. Um, the survey time series, the bottom trawl survey, samples petroli well. It might be the, the species that's most commonly caught in that survey. Um, something like 50% of the hauls have petroli. Um, and we now have 20 years of that data. Um, and th there have been a few sort of anomalously large toes that seem to be winter spawning aggregation-like, but occurring in September. So that makes the index a little bit noisier. Uh, but in general, the, the model has been able to fit the 2019 model and the preliminary work we've done so far for 2023, the model is able to fit that index quite well. Um, and that the changes in, in, in the index, which is primarily, it was low in the beginning, in current index started in 2003, after about 10 years, uh, it, it went steeply upwards and now it's been kind of at a higher plateau um, for the last 10 years, uh, eight years. Um, and the age and length data from the fishery and from the survey corroborate <laughs> that change by showing evidence of large cohorts that, that were born um, in the late <laughs> 2000s um, that, you know, <laughs> have gotten older and bigger and heavier and 
grew, you know, were more selected um, and all that led to the, the increase in index. So, you know, in general, that there's consistency among the, the primary data sources, survey compositions, fishery compositions, and, you know, the index trend. Um, and, and we're choosing not to include the, the fishery CPUE in, in the current assessment because it, it well, the, the time series ended when the stock was declared overfished and fish her behavior changed a lot. Um, uh, and, and sensitivity analyses to excluding that index show that, that it no longer has a significant impact on the assessment. So that's not to say that there's not additional complexity. You know, there's there seems to be a little bit of spatial variation in selectivity of the fishery that we're only beginning to explore now. Um, there's maybe spatial variation in where recruitment is occurring, um, possibly a little bit of spatial variation in growth, but that amount of variation seems, you know, well within sort of the tolerance of the the broad brush strokes that our stock assessment is designed to to work within um, and at the coastwide level, you know, the the model seems to be fitting the data well. Great, Anything thank add, you. Lana? Sorry, that, that might've been more long-winded than you intended. <laughs> no, that and was super helpful. Right, I would certainly support Ian's uh, words on that, uh, uh, evaluation of the uh, petroleum soil assessment, uh, I, my um, uh, maybe viewpoint can be a little bit biased because I worked before on many of the data poor assessment and uh, uh, looking at petroleum, how the assessment uh, behaves and we are trying different uh, uh, different things with model structure, with the uh, treatment of data sources and uh, the uh, the outputs are very similar, no matter what we try. So therefore, it's really a good signal coming from the data sources. And uh, uh, I would agree that this assessment does not have any uh, complications, which I saw with many other species uh, in the past. That is a hugely helpful perspective. I didn't even think about that coming from data poor to data rich. That's great. Good to hear. Okay. All right, so uh, do we have any additions, comments from other folks on the call? Let's see. I might just um, call oh, out Nick Tolomeri, who's been doing some work on um, updating the environmental index of recruitment that he and Melissa Altec and others worked on in the past. And updating that has been a little bit complicated. But that, that's not a source of conflict with other data sources, but just that getting a, a an index with the data we have available is a challenge. But Nick, you could speak to that or, or what you found so far. Yeah, I, I can check in. So for the earlier papers, we used ROMS data from 1980 to 2010 as our sort of environmental predictors or ROMS output. Um, and then recently I started looking at, you know, then there's a, we have data, we have output now from 2011 to 2022, I think it is, but um, there are some differences between the two. I don't know whether they're different ROMs models or updated ROM models, but there's differences between the two time periods in terms of the ROMs output. Um, and there are some big jumps and sort of changes in some of the, yep, some of the parameters that make it, seem at least not possible to string the two together. Yeah. Um, and some of the bot some of the temperatures things that seem to jump a lot. So um, one of the things I have started doing is trying to, I'm going to look at whether we, there's another big model, Gloris, I think of G-L-O-R-Y-S that Isaac Kaplan turned me on to that has sort of 1993 um through present so I've, i'm sort of starting to download those data and i'll probably try to do a similar thing that we've done in the past like calculate the same parameters that we used in those papers and and see how they match up um i also played around with some basin scale indicators that are reported in the ccia um the np north pacific mpgo pdo and om and the uh, el nino indicators and was able to get you know, doing the same thing by 
blocking it off into particular time periods, was able to get some decent correlations between the NPGO and PDO, both in the pre-spawning periods and in the current year with 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 then predicting recruitment. So that I mean, they're always a little wary of using base and scale things because they're not sort of strictly mechanistic in their connections, but um, there may be, and that that's, I have a sort of thing I've been preparing for Ian and, and Vlada um, that uh, summarizes that, that I can send to people. It's, you know, it's, it's a work in progress. But that's, I think my summary. Does that sound good? Yes, thank you. Sorry, like Melissa. Looks like, looks like Melissa has her hand up too. Oh, good. I should have um, asked somebody from the EWG to also take notes because I'm foolishly trying to notice hands and taking notes. <laughs> so, if others could please jump in. But yes, thank you, Mary, for noticing. Uh, we have um, Melissa then Andrew. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, I was. It's good to hear that the trolley model is still as stable as ever. I think it's probably the most informative ground fish data set we have on the West Coast. So uh, <laughs> you don't have to do too much guessing. Um, one of the issues I was going to raise uh, is that the petroli trends in the stock are really driven by very few exceptionally large recruitments. We haven't seen one in a long time. And so that is something to pay attention to. And it is one of the reasons why understanding recruitment dynamics for petroli is important because the fishery is really being carried on on a very occasional, very large year classes. Um, so for what it's worth, I would just keep that in mind. And Nick, I'm sorry to hear that the the ROMS model has a disconnect, which we knew about, which is why we ended it the previous study. Um, so we're kind of in the in the point of a, a do over on that one, unless that problem can be resolved. Um, maybe the CEFI funds, if they ever happen, will solve all of our ROMS model output problems. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the Glorus, I'm sorry ahead. to interrupt you, I mean, the Glorus one is more continuous as far as I understand it and more and sort of tracks actual observations pretty well. So, and is like, you know, you can get it all the way up into Alaska and stuff like that. So that might be a substitute to sort of like rerun the same thing that we did for ROMs, check that it works with that, with those, you know, the, the new, predict the predictors in the new model work and then move forward with yep. that instead. Yep. yep. Yeah, that's that's awesome to hear that's happening. Anyways, just the point is, I guess my point is pay attention to recruitment patterns for Petroli. There's like a steady trickle of, of kind of lower level recruitments, but it's really the big one, occasional big ones that are driving the bus on stock trends. Sounds like all of it. Okay, uh, let's see, Andrew Thompson, you are next. And then I think followed by Corey Niles and Jamil Samori. Thanks, Yvonne. Just two quick comments. Melissa, I think you have absolutely hit the nail on the head that epithotic recruitment drives the sort of fishery dynamics for most of the species that we do, we manage. I think the rule is <clears throat> recruitment failure, and then you're hoping for a good recruitment cost to crop up to keep the stock going. Um, that's certainly the case for Hake and even I'd say for CPS. Um, so I, I do believe that that is the most important question we can be addressing is what's causing um, these episodic recruitment successes to occur. And that's sort of where we have a chance to contribute to this process the best, I think, through a risk analysis. Um, are we experiencing in the, in the given year conditions that seem to be lining up to um, support a large recruitment class? Um, so thank you for saying that. Um, and Nick, um, I, this might be a little bit in the weeds, but I've become increasingly cautious about using base and scale indices <clears throat> to say anything about local scale dynamics, because it seems to me that there's been an increasing disconnect between, for example, the PDO or the Nino index in particular, the PDO as well, though, and the NPGO, and what, you know, the local environmental conditions are that the fish are actually experiencing. And so case in point this year, the PDO is low, um, even though the water temperatures were close to, you know, were anonymously warm. Um, and so 
I've just been seeing kind of having alarm bells go off in my head recently when I've been thinking about using the PDO or any of those basin scale indices for any types of predictions. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I kind of did it on a whim because I was, you know, it's in the IEA, so it's like the yeah. first three things we produce in the ESR, these basic <clears throat> skill things. Um, um, and so I, I did it probably just to check because I was frustrated with the ROM stuff not working. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and I agree with you that it's, it's uh, partly dangerous and not very satisfying either, but, you know, because of the, that the direct sort of more mechanistic connection isn't really there and you never know whether it's what it's really summarizing from the point of view of yeah. the fish. Um, so it, I, I did it because it seemed like an obvious thing to at least test since we report those. Um, but I would agree that we want to be a bit wary about how much faith we put into it going forward, um, which is why, like, I've also sort of switched off to the Glorus stuff to see if I can do something with that and produce a, you know, a, a more usable, you know, now cast kind of pr production stuff. That's okay. I think I said Corey and then Jamil, and I think I'm getting uh hands mixed up and then melissa and if you are don't need your hand up please just check to pull it down so go ahead corey yeah <laughs> excuse me um i didn't catch everything ian and vlada said or and if but um i think remembering back to our discussions at in the among the ewg uh, maybe it was kiva or mary saying that petroli was a little bit more um the environmental indices might even help with recruitment more for petroleum than sable fish because the uh well, while while the data is probably as good as it gets it doesn't get the young fish as well on the survey is that am i remembering that right and um uh, that's my understanding i think ian could comment more but i think the patrol the ground fish survey doesn't really catch them until they're older like two or three years old. I mean, they get a few smaller ones, so that's where a good environmental index that really was good would help inform those sort of few years where the age structure data aren't very good. Whereas, does that make sense? Two years old show up in the survey. Yeah, somebody can correct me on the specifics, but whereas I think, you know, for sablefish, the troll survey does catch a reasonable number of smaller ones, so it may not be as good or as, you know, as important to the, those stock assessments, but I'll let the stock assessors, yeah, age zeros show up for the sable fish. Um, and actually the, the, the age zeros from the troll survey match the peaks in recruitment from the stock assessments pretty well, which is obviously a bit circular because they're informing that anyway, but um, I'll leave it there. Somebody who knows more about stock assessments can. Okay, uh, Jamil, you're up next and then Melissa. Thanks, and I'll use this as an opportunity to say sorry about the unmuted situation uh, earlier. Um, at least it was during break. Um, I want to first just make an observation uh, based on Vlada's and Ian's really helpful comments. Is, is it just, I mean, to me, that demonstrated the value of thinking about these risk evaluations in a comparative or relative sense. Like, what's the assessment uncertainty like? compared to other ones that we've done. Um, that's different than thinking of assessment uncertainty in an absolute sense, but I, I still think it's really valuable. So I'm glad we're doing Sablefish next and we'll have like something concrete to stick to and to sort of discuss with council and advisory bodies. The second thing, um, as Nick, as you were talking, it, it struck me that it was really helpful to hear about um, the uncertainty we have about environment and recruitment relationships at different times in the recent past, but that seems different than the need here in this table where we need to get to that conclusion level X, you know, it's like conclusion with some amount of uncertainty and you've given us the some amount of uncertainty. So I'm wondering like, do you, could you say anything um, about current or recent conditions relative to what we think we understand about environment recruitment relationships for Petrali? Should we expect it to be higher or lower in this year and in the near future? There you go. 
Sorry, I'm not sure. I mean, the the problem is, I the ROM stuff doesn't predict well. I mean, the the discontinuities means like I don't know what the you know like essentially from 2011 forward what the correct coefficients are supposed to be for those models, right? Because they they actually sort of switch. Um, well, they, but I, I don't know if that answers the question. But I I think with the the trolley stuff from the ROM's point of view at the moment, no. But maybe in a couple of weeks with Gloris stuff, if I can get that organized, we might be better off. Because that that is fairly, I think that goes through 2023, right? So it's continuous. So so just sorry to jump in, but okay. So then to like complete the loop there, then when we're thinking about climate and ecosystem information, we don't have any at the moment related to environment recruitment relationships for Petrali. And so we should look to other types of ecosystem and climate information to think about how we would assign a level. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I mean, there's the, there's the basin scale stuff if you want to believe that. Um, but like Andrew said, there's it's a little sketchy because it doesn't necessarily match the actual conditions the fish are experiencing. Um, I think one question would be, which I've also sort of been poking around on is, you know, for some of the ROMs predictors, can we actually re replace them with actually observed values, you know, from wind buoys or something like that and do a similar analysis? Uh, and I've been poking around on that a little bit, but haven't gotten very far at the moment. Okay, well, I think that, um, you know, highlights a, a scheduling issue that we have because we're going to have to make sure that that we um, we encourage Nick and others to mess around with different models at a uh, time of time of year when we can get the information or we just use best available, which is what we normally would have to do. So maybe if it doesn't work out, then we look back to the ecosystem status report and think about what values in the ecosystem status report might uh, affect Petrali Sol. So uh, go ahead, Melissa. Thanks, Yvonne. I was just going to go back to Mary's comment about how these things are useful and um, there's the recent recruitment indicators, right? There's a recent past, like the past few years where we don't have other data to inform what recruitment looks like for Petrali. That's, you know, the past two, maybe three years um, as the survey information comes online and they start to show up in the sampling. And so if you're thinking about the recent past, yes, this is probably more useful for fish where you don't sample them in the survey when they're really young or small. For sablefish, we see them at age zero in the survey and the, the recruitment indicators largely agree with what we see on the survey. So they don't make a difference in the historical time series all that much. The real utility for those and potentially for the Petroli one as well is projecting forward. So we only do these assessments every like four to 10 years, depending on what's going on. We project forward right now with catches in an average recruitment assumption. But if you can catch, if you can project forward with catches and an environmental time series that tells you something about recruitment, that's actually very useful. And so I think that projection component is probably beyond the scope of this first iteration of risk tables. But at some point, thinking about how you would use a risk table in between benchmark or pool assessments. To capture that for you know the forward looking thing when you don't have all of the other data on the full assessment would be useful. And I and for sablefish, the real utility is the forward looking projection in my mind when you're projecting the model without all the other data, only with catches. And you can modify that average recruitment assumption that we make, but is generally wrong. So uh Food for thought. Yeah, uh, nutritious food for thought. That's a really important idea, and I was just letting it percolate. Um, Andrew, you're up next, but I'm going to just, does anyone have any 
comments in response to what Melissa just said, because I think that's, imp I really like that and want us to capture it in our report, the idea that um, stocks, and of course, it's sort of evident that stock assessments themselves are forward looking. So when we're thinking about um, ecosystem variables, we need to think about, you know, projections that are also forward looking and, um, I'm not sure how we capture that, but uh, please open your mutes and talk and let's see if we can get some good ideas flowing. I've got Corey, Elliot, and Melissa, I don't know if you had a follow-up comment, John yeah. Field. Um, let's, let's let John go because he hasn't spoken much on the call. Oh, man, you're daring me to speak a lot. That's dangerous. <laughs> um, I guess I was going to add that it, in addition to the assessments themselves, there's other roles for this kind of information, both with respect to things like assessment prioritization and sort of maybe taking the temperature or, or the pulse of uh, what a stock might be doing between uh, assessment intervals. You know, as Melissa mentioned, some of these assessments might happen only every four to six to eight years uh, or more for some. So anything we could do to kind of, you know, evaluate in the absence of doing a full assessment, what we think might be going on, whether a good year class may have come in or not, might also help uh, with strategic thinking with respect to risk, as well as uh, how we prioritize our um, upcoming assessment cycle schedule. That's it. Thanks. Uh, let's see. I'm sorry. Then I, I totally went off. Did, Corey, did I say you were next? And then Elliot and then Andrew? Yeah, I guess I just, um, and thanks, John. That was, that's helpful. We did talk a bit about the, um, some of those things on Monday. Um, yeah, I guess what am I in just expressing not confusion, but still working through this, but, you know, Melissa's comments are about, um, using this information within the assessment in producing assessment forecast estimates so forth but the risk tables i thought the point was to take the information into account that's not included in the assessment so um with that purpose you know i'm maybe just articulating okay how do we if it's in the assessment what goes into these risk tables how are we supposed to use them I had a bit of a sideways comment, so I'm glad to let yeah, anyone no, else go, go if they want to respond to that. No, go no ahead, the Corey's point's a good one. Okay, I'll, I'll say mine quickly is just to say that you know, coming you know, thinking about this between assessment scale, I think if we're particularly bringing in environmental predictors or environmental indicators, that's something we have really good at. We're starting to get really good assessment of the skill of those in terms of forecast mode. So I do. Think that's a nice thing to think about long term, but I do kind of agree with Corey's comment. You know, versus you know, how do we how do we differentiate these two, or do we need to if there's a environmental variable in a stock assessment versus what goes in the risk table is something that's still um, is a little up. Good, thank you, um, Andrew, and then Kelly Johnson. Thanks, Yvonne. Um, and listening to all this discussion, it occurs to me that I think that a really low hanging fruit for our risk assessment based upon ecosystem considerations is to go through all of the surveys that are being conducted on the West Coast and see which ones might have some um, actual recruitment information within them. Um, so, for example, um, the survey that John Field leads, the Rockfish Cruise, I think has as far as I know, the only tangible quantitative information on CPS recruitment. Um, and, you know, so you can see if there's a lot of small anchovies, you can see if there's a lot of small sardines in a given year. And I don't know if that information is being considered at the stock assessment or yeah, at the stock assessment level, um, but it, I think that it should. So I think that that's step one is to go through all the surveys and see if there's a potential to get some rot recruitment information out of them. And so another one that I'm aware of is the um, is the JSOES, the Juvenile Salmon Ocean Ecosystem Observation Survey. So, you know, that survey is intended for 
um, getting information on various stages of salmon, but they also collect information on a lot of other species. And maybe they have, you know, some information, some size structure for some of those species that could be helpful um, for, you know, stable fish or something along those lines. They go out every year. That information doesn't really see the light of day. Um, but it's it's a it could be that could be a valuable like piece of information for us because really what we one of the things we're trying to do here is say are is in the future years do we think these particular stocks with Charlie or stable fish or whatever are they going to be in better or worse shape than they are now and so that can be sort of a metric by which we can help adjust the ABC and so if we have some information. The guides us as to whether it looks like there's one of these episodic strong recruitment classes, that would be a really good place for us to start. And I'm just going to put in the chat a link to Natalia Gallo's paper, which um, summarized all of the different surveys that we're aware of on the West Coast. And I think that a good starting place would be for us to think about whether any of those surveys could provide recruitment information in ways that um, currently we haven't necessarily been using them. Okay, but thank I, you, I Andrew. Do, do, yeah, sorry. So I think that that's step one. And then step two is to look at the environmental conditions that um, may have helped predict whether that strong rec recruitment class came to be. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Kelly Johnson, you're next. And then Kiva Oaken, and then Elliot and John Field. If those are legacy hands, please take them down. And if not, we'll call on you later. Okay, so go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to mention that currently in the framework, the statistical framework that we use, we cannot use information going forward into the future to inform recruitment for our projections. So that's something that we're working on. Uh, or that we know that we need to develop, but it's not something that we can actually use. Okay, thank you for that uh, that distinction there. Um, and then is that the case that so that that's the case generally and not just for the assessments that you're working on? They all use the same framework and every right. Sorry. assessment that is done for the Pacific Fishery Management Council that relates to ground fish uses the same stock synthesis. So okay. it's all the same. Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Kiva. Um, yeah, I was just going to say uh, first. With regards to Corey's question, um, I think that Stephanie mentioned yesterday that if there's an environmental driver in an assessment, they leave it out of the risk table. So it sort of doesn't get to be double counted, basically. Um, and then uh, with for uh, Andrew's comment on surveys, um, I can't speak to coastal pelagics, but a lot of ground fish assessments do use the Rockfish recruitment and eco use that survey um, and include an index of recruitment from that survey, it's not actually very informative. Um, it tends to be very, very noisy um, with large error, like it has really large error bars, um, really high sampling error. And so it makes it difficult. I, I don't like, I, so there's a canary index in it and we're using it and it'll be in the assessment, but it, I'm not sure it's going to do much in the assessment because it's going to have very large error bars. So I think it's hard, it's hard to measure recruitment, uh, both empirically and like, yeah, yeah. Andrew knows that that's why it's going to be his life mission. Okay, go ahead, Corey. Yeah, maybe a slight uh, tangent here, but I'm kind of, I'm I'm having fuzzy memories back to maybe with Sablefish and Melissa's comments a long time that I'm going to get wrong. But I'm wondering how um, transboundary conser considerations might be worked into here. Even you know, the, we do a coastwide petroleum soil assessment, but I I, I think from what uh, and Ian and Vlada, please correct me if I'm wrong, but. Um, you know, you read that there's still like site fidelity to spawning grounds you read about and, you know, the Washington fishery before the 
Magnuson Act was basically took a place off of Vancouver Island. And um, I know there's efforts from that NIMS is working on to look at, maybe we'll leave Sablefish aside till next, but to look look across the boundaries more. But yeah, I was wondering, could, um, and maybe just putting it out there for further thought, discussions over summer, but could we, how would transboundary type considerations be worked into this risk table? And, and those being that we're not, um, international boundaries in particular, not directly putting those into the assessment. And, like, you know, if recruitment's coming from Canada, fish, what does that mean kind of thing, but. Well, uh, since that's a, a sort of um, out of left field question, I'm gonna ask you to answer your own question. Not there. Can't do that. <laughs> we do. I don't know uh, if it exactly answered the questions, but we uh, answered the question, Corey. But uh, we do uh, keep in touch with our Canadian colleagues who are developing patrol soil assessment this year as well, and we are exchanging information to uh, conduct the series of sensitivity analysis to see. Um, and uh, like to see outside of the model whether in the CISA uh, of similar trends or whether uh, including the including the catches from Canada would change uh, substantially our results. But we don't uh, um, we don't incorporate any of that like multiple areas or transboundary um, attempts in this uh, year assessment. Thanks a lot, and yeah, I've always appreciated the efforts you've made. I think I, I want to remembering maybe dark blotch and POP, but um, yeah, I'm wondering in dogfish too. You got, um, but yeah, I just wonder if we could, it would be worth like putting anything into that first first set of columns. But um, yeah, I know it's not even. Yeah, very much appreciate the efforts. Okay, so then uh, Kiva, did you have a follow up comment? And then Andrew, did you have another comment? And then I think we're gonna try to wrap up a trolley soul. Cool. Yeah, just a really quick one. I just want to support what Corey said. That was something that I was thinking about saying late earlier, but I'm glad he said it. Um down south, what's going on in Mexico is hugely important to a lot of our stocks. And we don't know much about that. Probably a lot less than what you know about Canada and the north. But I have been seeing that if you look at sort of if you take data and combine Mexican and American data for when it's available, then that really can shift your patterns of what's going on with the species. And that has probably large implications too for um, like what's going on in Mexico can have large implications for what's going on in the US. So that's something that's probably worth pursuing down the line. And maybe, I don't know if that can be formally incorporated into our risk assessments here, but it's definitely something to think about. Okay, um, I'm going to ask the EWG to um, put a bookmark on that transboundary question and maybe think about, um, you know, is the risk evaluation table the right place for that? Is that the right place for that? The species selection criteria table, sort of where in the process do we think about these transboundary questions? Okay, it is, according to my computer, 1051. Um, I think that we will, um, it would be great. We're on schedule to talk about Sablefish at 11 o'clock, from 11 to 11.45. How about if we just take another five minute break, come back at 1057, talk about Sablefish, and then there will be general public comment at the very end, um, roughly scheduled for 11.45. Will that work for folks? Okay, thank you so much, um, particularly to Vlada and Ian for coming and um, I really appreciate the Petrali Soul insights that people were sharing in the last hour. And uh, thank you. <laughs> making sure it we can- It was nice to see everyone. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Good luck. A lot of tea this morning. Eh.
started my next one. All right, it is 10.58. I suppose I should have been, uh, should have given everyone to 11. But uh, our next species up is sable fish. And Kelly and Melissa, if you're still on, we're hoping to quiz you a little bit about how things are going with the stock assessment. And I, um, and if you wouldn't mind, oh, thank you, Kelly. Um, uh, I know that, the um this is an update and it was sort of a surprise to um end up doing sable fish again this year and so uh and we the ecosystem work group had originally come into the march council meeting proposing to just provide a pilot table for petroli sole um and then uh Corey Niles urged us to consider sablefish, which the council took up. So, uh, oh, whoops, we've got a note in the chat. Um, ecosystem work group, you are needed in the notes section. Elliot's fingers are getting tired. And so I'm going to ask, let's see, would someone from the ecosystem work group please um, volunteer? <laughs> volunteer to help Elliot with the notes. Uh, did anyone raise their hands? Yeah, I think we're good, Yvonne. Go okay, all right, good, good, good. All, all right, thank you. Andrew, did you have a comment or are you volunteering to, to help type? I was raising my hand to volunteer. Um, okay, Elliot, thank you. Show me, can, can you send me the link to another chat so I can just get on it real quick, please? Okay. All right, good. Thank you. And thank you, Mary. And I um, am sort of taking uh, a lesser degree of notes on the risk evaluation tables that I'm sharing on the screen when those, when the comments are directly addressing the, uh, the species we're talking about. All right, so let me share that uh, risk evaluation table. And then, Andrew, I'll chat you that um, via Gchat. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for putting up with our Oh, good. All right. So <clears throat> sablefish, everyone's favorite um, thing to catch and thing to, favorite thing to eat and um, general uh, West Coast icon. Uh, so let's ta start by talking about, let's talk again about the assessment. And um, I would appreciate it, Kelly, would you mind giving us just a quick um, reminder for both the ecosystem work group and for everyone, for folks who may not have been following stable fish as closely this year, um, would you tell us what sort of um, flavor of stock assessment or assessment update we're getting this year and sort of give us a little bit of history on how we ended up with uh, stable fish on the list this year? I might not be the best one to explain why sablefish is on the list this year, especially given other people on the call. But with respect to what the assessment is, it's a statistical catch at age uh, assessment, very similar to Petroli that uses stock synthesis and it uses both lengths and ages, but is primarily age based. And so we just use lengths for those fish that don't have ages or 
for the bottom trawl survey, we use what's called conditional agent length. And so it partitions in this length bin, the fish were of these ages for a given year, which helps estimate growth. And there's no recreational data similar to Petrali. It's just based off of commercial data. And then uh, I think Kiva, that was you in the chat as far as like what a limited update means. And uh, I don't, I don't know. It's it's a fuzzy gray area, but I think the the biggest thing here is that the aging lab is working really hard to dedicate time to age the last two years of our bottom trawl survey. And because stable fish are seen at a very young age, then we can expect to be able to better estimate recruitment if we age all of those fish but we are not aging any of the commercial fishery samples, which also collect very young fish. So that's where it's a limited update. Limited being that not all data sources that go into the model will be updated by the time the assessment is due. Okay, thank you for that, Kelly. And then Owen Hamel, I see you might have some wisdom to share. Yeah, I thought I could uh, respond a little bit to the question of why we're um, doing this this year. Um, so there had been some concerns uh, in the fishing industry last year that they were seeing a lot of small fish, um, but we hadn't seen, you know, uh, you know, we didn't have a 2020 uh, survey clearly. 2021, we we did see some more. Um, smaller sable fish in the survey, but looking at uh, proportions, it wasn't out of sync with what we had seen in the past, um, but in the 2021, but then earlier this year, looking at the 2021 and 2022 surveys, we realized, um, in fact, the 2021 survey uh, saw a lot more sable fish than we had seen in recent years. And in fact, saw more small sable fish than we had ever seen in our survey since 2003 when we started the survey. And we also, um, in 2022, there were even more. So a lot of age zero, ones, twos, and threes. We're not sure exactly what ages they are. That's why we have to age them. Um, as Kelly said, it's limited. It's a limited update. We're not aging the fishery data. Uh, the recent fishery data, um, and also we may do some more exploration because, uh, you know, conditional agent length works really well for things like rockfish or for older fish that aren't growing as quickly, but for the young fish where the timing of catch and also variability in growth from year to year can, can cause that conditional agent length to be not quite as informative, we might just use age data for these recent data. So um, there's gonna be extra exploration, but it's also limited in terms of what we're um, looking at. Uh, in any case, the reason we're doing it is if we didn't do it, the current projected catch levels or limits um, going forward would be possibly quite limiting in terms of bycatch of all these young fish that appear to be coming in if we didn't do the assessment. The assessment will allow um, catch limits to go up in 2025 if we see what we expect out of the assessment. Okay, well, so that's an interesting comment and almost makes me wonder if that's a uh, population dynamic comment, like um, it, it, that bycatch of young sable fish could uh, drive a lot of challenges in fishery management. So, okay, go ahead, Melissa. I was just gonna add to Owen's comment because the Alaska region is having the same issue with bycatch of small sable fish. It's a common pinch point. Um, it's kind of like the reverse of having too low a stock size. <laughs> um, so bycatch of small fish exhibiting big recruitments are troublesome and they're troublesome not just for the Pacific coast. 
So there's some common ground perhaps to be gained from talking across regions on this. Good, thank you. All right, so uh, let me just start with the question. It's so it's a thinking about whether there are problems, challenges, issues with the assessment. It sounds like um, the uh, so it's it sounds like it's not um, you know. There's been a lot of assessments of sable fish. It's been tested a lot. You're using sort of um, usual methods and data, except in the limited style this year. But um, it's not a data poor assessment. It's uh, there's not some new discovery of something wonky going on with data sets that you've used in the past. Sort of general. Um, you know, there's not going to be big surprises. Well, that we know of yet, uh, in terms of confidence in the assessment, is that fair? Yeah, I think so. Okay. All right. Good. Well, so then essentially we're that's great. So we're in a sort of similar place in terms of uh, data going into the assessment. So, so, um, would we so for us for the column on assessment related concerns and getting to Jamil's earlier point of it's useful to compare species it sounds like we would not have greater assessment level con assessment concerns with sablefish than we did with petrali but just note as it would be noted in the stock assessment um that we're not going to be able to um, age some of the um, some of this commercial data. Is that fair? And I see Melissa and Corey have comments. Oh, sorry, I keep forgetting to put my hand down. That's okay. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, I'll go back to, um, I think part of why this was possibly interesting was, and this is the way that Jim Hasty described it to the council. Um, he, I, I have his words written down somewhere in one of our emails from, from March, or, um, but he was basically saying that the Science Center would expect to urge caution on on um, the results of this assessment, so he was making it sound like it would be a, more uncertain in, in a different situation than what we would uh, be looking at if if it was um, not a limited assessment. So that was that was part of the thinking from me back then. Of okay, this sounds, you know, Heather. He was in response to a question. Heather asked, you know, sablefish and in the past. I think I think you all have had to depart from the strict update rules to make the model work, and so I think she was trying to like, well, is that going to happen again? And Jim kind of went expanded as he does, and yeah, so that was he was suggesting to the council that there would be discussions about uh, looking at the assessment outputs differently, given that they could be two to three times higher than what, where the ACL is now, and. It being a slightly different situation, but I don't know if Owen had thoughts on that. But yeah, that was what Jim said to the council. Thanks, Corey, Kiva, and then Kelly. Uh, yeah, Owen and Kelly can speak to this more than me, but I would say I don't think it's in the same category as Petrali Soul because um, we don't have all of Petrali Soul does have all of the data sort of through today um like it, it includes ages from the fishery through 2022 um and uh sablefish isn't going to have updated fishery ages so in that way we have this source of uncertainty because we didn't update all of our data um and and in addition i think um there's more uh as an assessment scientist you know they're sort of re-examining the entire structure of the post Charlie soul assessment model this year and there's no opportunity to do that um, for sable fish 
so I, I, I would say it, 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 it has, I, I would, I would put it in a different category than the trolley. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that makes sense. So Kelly, did you want to elaborate or have a different point? Uh, it's on the same point and I just want to attempt to explain a little bit the estimates of uncertainty. Even when you have two data sources, and this has been shown in simulation analysis. So when you know what the truth is and you have observation error around that truth, if you even have two surveys that are surveying the exact population and you put both of those into the assessments and the data are giving you the same story, your estimates of your parameters will be more certain and though then your advice can be more certain and so even if the fishery data and the survey data were telling us the exact same thing our estimates have the potential to be more certain and that's what we're going to miss out on here but they could be conflicting as well we don't know because we don't have the data but it's not that the data are uncertain it's just that we have less sources of information to tell us what's going on. Okay, thank you. That was uh, an excellent distinction. Um, as you know, you're on a call with a lot of people who are not success and scientists, so it helps to have that stuff reiterated for us. Okay, Kiva, did you have another follow up? Don't worry, it's totally fine. I'd rather have extra hands than no hands at all. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Good. Uh, Lynn, Mass, did you want to make a comment? I saw you had a chat there and I didn't know if you wanted to elaborate on that. Nope. Okay. <laughs> Okay. All right. Good. Um, so let's talk a little bit about a sablefish population dynamics. Um, it was interesting to hear there was some conversation about this. Um, and so Jamil, you're right. Having a little species to compare to each other helps. And maybe that'll be something that we put in our, um, in our report, uh, to not just do one species at a time. Um, so the, the, the positive, on the positive side, sablefish uh, prey recruits seem to appear more in the surveys than petroli sole do. So, um, but is there anything else we need to think about about sablefish population dynamics um, that might uh, might be taken into account in thinking about harvest levels? And I think what I should do is switch to the um, risk assessment table. We can do that so we can remind ourselves of or the risk classification table. Okay, so. What we're seeing, I think maybe we conflated population dynamics and their risk. And Go ahead, Corey. While I'm figuring out what we're. Um, yeah, I think Melissa kind of touched on it already, but um, you know, the story with sable fish was that it was, it was in the precautionary zone and not coming out for a long time. But then it, it changed, and then the last assessment, um, said it was never in the precautionary zone yet. Um. There was still at one time, you know, before the young fish just started booming, um, that 
doing separate assessments for Alaska, Canada, and the U.S. was in 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 isolation was not ideal, and so there's been a lot of efforts to do some research on that. I don't know if Melissa had anything to add, but um, it is thought to I think it'd be a uh, you know, not North Pacific, whatever you would call it, a North Pacific, a lot of mixing in the North Pacific and the, these boundaries are um, not biological boundaries necessarily, but that's that's been, was part of the, the story and the council had um, encouraged, asked for uh, looking at uh, North Pacific wine type of research in the not too distant past, but. It looks like Melissa is willing to comment on that. Go ahead. Your timing is good. That team, the science team is actually meeting in person next week for the first time in uh, like four years uh, to synthesize and, and start to think about how we're going to roll out the results of that MSC project. So we're on the cusp of being able to communicate uh, results from that. I guess I can give you a quick shot across the bow, which is that nothing any of the regions are doing is likely to lead to highly poor outcomes for the fishery. Uh, and that one of the take homes is that there's the stock south of 36 seems to be um, potentially more susceptible to localized depletion because it's at the extent of its range and it only has migration uh, coming, you know, going north as opposed to um, the other regions, which have more transiting of sable fish and Maya Kapur can probably give you a better explanation of this because this is her work. Um, so I guess I'll just leave you with stay tuned. We'll start rolling this out. Um, timing is still uncertain because the Alaska Center assessment cycle is going to heat up here uh, midsummer and into fall. Okay, well, that's exciting. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, well, so then uh, if we don't have anything else on population dynamics, I, what I'm getting from the conversation is that um, for assessment related considerations, we're a bit, you would be in the more concerned than Petrali category. For population dynamics considerations, that's where we discuss these new large um, year classes coming in and um, concerns with potential for um, high levels of bycatch constraining the fisheries and uh, how does the council account for those? Is that, have we covered those and we wanna talk about environmental and ecosystem considerations? Okay, I don't see any hands on that. So let's talk about ecosystem considerations and whether there are any environmental conditions that we know or think might particularly affect sable fish. Um, folks from the CCIEA, do you have any wisdom to share on um, variables that we need to think about for sable fish in particular? Yeah, sorry to jump. What, what is causing these big year classes? Anybody know? Any theories? So Nick is not, I think, on the call anymore. He's been looking at this more than um, uh, uh, Melissa yeah. may still be, and she might be able to fill I, some I'm blanks. In. Oh, Nick, you are on the call. Minutes. Oh, great. Um, Go. For Please go uh, ahead then. Well, the only thing I'd, I'd add is that the the sea level index that Melissa and I had worked with did predict, would have predicted the first, I guess the 2020 or 20, I'm losing track of years, but that one big initial recruitment would have been, would have been it, but it didn't, seems to have not agreed in the not predicted high abundances in 2022, 
I think the more the last years of the ground fish trawl data. Um, don't know why, you know, it, it it's the, the overall correlation isn't particularly high for that sea level index, but it, it does sort of generally pick up some of the big ones. I think we've had some questions about um, talking with some of the trawl people about whether the high numbers in 2022 are kind of just older 2021 fish that didn't grow as much or whether they're really another big recruitment in 2022. Um, but that's all I have at the moment. If that makes and, and Nick, from your um, from your sea level height work and your circulation model uh, work, the previous work from ROMS, have you hypothesized what some mechanisms are to answer Corey's question? Well, the, from the ROMS, for what's causing the big year classes? Well, we had a certain amount of, if I remember, from the ROMS thing. I mean, the, the sea level is a proxy for a lot of transport things that probably Andrew can explain better than I can, but from the ROM stuff, um, there's, there seem to be a combination of temperature at certain times of year, uh, particularly um, if I remember correctly during the pre-spawning portion, so sort of female conditioning prior to spawning, and then some transport at depth was the earlier ROMs thing, especially sort of transport around a thousand meters when they're in a yolk stack, yolk sack at st larval stage. Um, transport to the north where, you know, we hypothesized that once they then surfaced back up again, they, if they were transported to north, they would then um, match up with, you know, sort of high quality northern zooplankton. But a lot of those are sort of not particularly observed variables and you know the deep, that deep deep transport from what i understand does that make sense and i would have to yes yes it does uh but oh, it only makes sense because i reread your papers recently <laughs> so um i don't know if anyone's put those in the chat yet but if you would that would be great so melissa did you have a follow-up yeah. comment well, I was just going to help Nick out because I'm sitting here looking at the paper. <laughs> it's all in the paper. <laughs> um, but yeah, just to recap, it was uh, degree days for spawner preconditioning. And these are all depth and latitude and longitude specific to where we find these life stages. Um, cross your transport at the egg stage at depth, like Nick said, the degree days for egg development. Um, longshore transport uh, later in the le early life history, and then degree days for development of larvae. Were the, were the five covariates from that ROMS modeling that explained recruitment fairly well, but were kind of stymied again by not having a consistent time series of ROMS model outputs for stable fish. So maybe this is something that could be revisited with the Glories product um, because we kind of concluded we can't operationalize this because we can't get the model outputs we need. And this is why we backtracked to sea surface temperature, or not temperature, sorry, sea surface height in the stock assessment. Yeah, I, I, I'm sort of in the process of getting the Glorious data organized, but then I would certainly plan to basically to kind of redo stuff for petroleum and sablefish to see if I can match up the results and get a good indicator going forward. I do have to run to another meeting, so I'm going to bounce out, and I think Melissa can probably answer any of those questions. Thanks for participating, Nick. Thanks, Nick. Okay. All right. Good. So, um, Jamil and Elliot, how is that sounding to you as our IEA folks? Um, the the level height, and are there other, I don't even know, I can't even remember the ecosystem status report. You, whether you even report on that, um, but go ahead, Elliot. I see. Well, you I just up. wanted to go back to a point that was brought up previously: is that if it's being brought into the stock assessment, that might not be the variables we want to include in the risk table. So I would encourage us to look, I guess, beyond the sea surface height for the risk table um, personally, and just to start. It might be good to have a brainstorming session about other variables that could be included, um, you know, in in more of a qualitative contextual case, but 
Jamil, please feel free to overrule me. Uh, I, I agree. I was going to say something similar. Um, I, at, at the risk of eye rolls for those of us that have been around for a dozen years or more, we did put out an ecosystem considerations for sablefish report in 2011, and that reviewed other elements of the ecosystem that may influence sablefish dynamics like predators and prey on different life stages uh, in addition to other factors. So that could be a good resource for us to consult. Um, there's also an ecosystem consideration section in Melissa will say which assessment, but one from a couple of years ago that's fairly elaborate. Okay. Yeah. Good. Jump in. It, Jamil's right, and it was 2020. No, 2019. Sorry. 2019. Okay. And um, Jamil, thank you for thinking of that 2011 work, and please um, add that to our notes. So, Melissa, did you have your hand up? And then, um, okay. So, and then Corey and Elliot, I don't know if you had another comment. That looks like Andrew has, and Chris just raised his hand too. I can hold off. Okay. Andrew and Chris? This is probably so obvious, it's so silly, but does everybody agree that these environmental proxies are indices that we're trying to say provide the larvae with good food? Is that the mechanism that is underlying all of this, the ability of the larvae to eat food, which is appropriate to facilitate their survival to become recruits? Or is there something else that perhaps people um, are considering that I'm not, not thinking of? Uh, well, so does anyone else want to answer that? I can jump in rather than type it. Um, I think it's probably a combination of things, but one primary one is horizontal transport from deep water spawning areas onto the shelf where, yes, probably there's better feeding. Um, so I would say transport to where larvae are likely to encounter better food resources. I would add the the preconditioning of females uh, topic is is it's about larvae and that and it's potentially about uh, production of larvae that are in better condition, um, but it's distinct from direct provisioning of food to them. And and uh, there are others on the call that can comment on this, but preconditioning of females does seem to be something that's popping up with groundfish uh, in a couple of different cases that are in intriguing. Uh, and probably uh, happening at a time when uh, we don't have an awful lot of survey vessels on the water and also at a time when some of the recent, at least, uh, 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 environmental anomalies have been happening along the West Coast, um, uh, fall and winter, when heat waves have come to shore and so forth. But um, that's not why my oh. hand's up, though. But I'll I'll stop for so now. So let me just jump in and respond to that real quick. I, I agree that um, female preconditioning seems to be a general factor that um, has a large impact on the potential for larvae to survive. Um, a lot of the research we've been doing has shown that Preconditioning is manifested through the size at which larvae are born when they're first hatched, and specifically when they're larger when they're first hatched. That seems to be a consistent correlate for their um, probability of survival. And we've shown this with, now with anchovies and with a bunch of different rockfishes. It's and that's just the larval fish conference, and that seems to be popping up with lots of other species around the world. So. I, I think that the role of um, maternal investment has been, it's been mentioned a lot and now, but now we're seeing it be manifested through empirical results more so than we've seen in the past. So I, I agree with Chris that, that, that that's something to really consider and take a look at and, and think about the ways in which 
that maternal provisioning might impact the probability of recruitment. That's, I think that's going to be something that's going to be important to clean up. Okay, uh, I now am out of order and I'm not sure who I said next. Um, Chris, do you want to follow up on your last? You said you had something additional slash different um, from your last comment. Yeah, the additional thing I wanted to mention was another potential thing that we have reported on a little bit in past ecosystem status reports and that I think modeling is really making a tremendous amount of progress on is species distribution. Uh, and so when we have uh, factors like uh, environmental variability in bottom temperature or in dissolved oxygen, there are uh, potential for uh, impacts on or, or effects on distribution of um, Groundfish and sablefish, I think, might be one to consider. The question there for me is um, both, you know, how much certainty is uh, afforded by those kinds of models, and there are other people that could comment on that better than than I can. The other thing is um, for uh, the kind of data that you could have empirically. Um, and so it's not relying solely on model output, but uh, empirical data that would come from a trawl survey in a given year, just how tolerable or how tolerant we would be in this kind of risk table to data that hadn't been through the full round of QAQC from the trawl survey that the assessment authors would be looking for. Uh, th those data can lag by um, by many, many months um, or even years. And uh, I'm not at all judging the QAQC process. That's way over my head. But um, but if there's a uh, uh, some kind of coarser level of data that would be still useful for determining if distributions had shifted due to environmental drivers, that could be something that's worth talking about. Okay. Thanks, Chris. I think that, um, you know, that is something we've talked about in general is this question of whether, um, you know, there's environmental information that could capture a little bit or give us some ideas of what's been happening in more recent, recent year classes than those that might be addressed in the, in the stock system. Okay. Corey Niles and then Andrew. Yeah, I think I probably sit here at Pepper. Uh, Melissa and others with questions. Um, oh, David, I'm, I have a bigger picture thought. And I mean, I, I think the, the thing with sablefish, and you're just hearing the anecdotes, is that it, it seems like conditions were just maybe it's always like this, but it, they were good not just here, but in in the, in Alaska and Canada as well. Um, so yeah, what what? But I guess the bigger picture question is, and I guess I part of that question if till is if. And thanks, Melissa, for your chat about the petroleum all going, young petroleum all going to Canada to be silly about it. But um, so yeah, there are, there are those transboundary recruitment issues happening here too. But the bigger picture thing is going through these. I'm wondering, um, you know, how this this plays out in terms of like a lot of this stuff would seem to go into the research and data needs of the assessment, and you know, it's the the assessors and the star panel that decide and SSC decide which ones are going to be most fruitful um, to take up next. So yeah, just seeing that like what, and this will be an, a learning process for all, us all, but what goes into the here and how does the council use them versus what goes into the research and data part of the assessment. But so that was my, my bigger picture thought, but yeah, that's very, very interesting discussions. Okay, thanks, Corey. Um, all right, it is 11.37. Does anyone else have anything that they want to share about their thoughts on um, sablefish and the effects of the environment on sablefish at any of its life stages, things that we should be particularly looking for? I know we can go back again to um, Melissa and Nick's paper. Um, yeah but we're not going to have that opportunity for many other species. So um, go ahead, Kiva. I guess I just had a quick clarifying question for Chris. Um, so the survey data 
you know, so like the survey that occurs in summer of 2020 that occurred in summer of 2022, all of that survey data was online of, of the catches and stuff was online by, I think, January. Um, and so uh, I don't know if there's like other data, like oceanography or something that takes longer to process, but at least in assessment years, they're quite timely about posting that data because it, it needs, we do include the, that, uh, the survey from the previous summer in the, in the assessments. Okay, great. That that feels like uh, maybe my intel is outdated. Then is that true in in uh, off years as I'm well? I'm not the person to ask about that. Oh, okay. Well, thanks, Kiva. I appreciate that. It's it maybe just as long as I'm thinking about it though, and and it's a it's on the table. Um, it is, I think, just generally speaking, something that I think when we are considering the timetables that were reviewed on Monday of when the council needs data in or information in a way that's timely for the management cycle, that this this data provisioning and QAQC uh, consideration is just something that we do all collectively need to have on the table and that Science Center capacity needs to be uh, responsive to. Restarted, or if you decided, okay, that we we're going to be super boring for the rest of. <laughs> the rest no, of I'm it. doing a bad job on the recording today. Okay, so That's unfortunately. Fine. Okay. All right. Well, good. Um, so I think we are wrapped up on sailfish for now. We have some ideas of who we have to check in with as we get. Um, so the ecosystem work group will sort of proceed with this um, further into the um, the summer and try to figure out, okay, are there other better ways of filling out these tables so that we can provide the council with a pilot um, in, in September. Uh, we're not intending to pilot in in June, certainly not on the, um, the risk evaluation table. I'm not making any promises, but if we were to get anywhere uh, further along, it would probably be with the risk assessment table. Okay, uh, further along by June is what I meant. Um, so any other comments from the EWG or others about risk assessment tables? Uh, risk evaluation tables, petroleum sole, or sable fish before we move on to um, sort of open public comment period. Mike Okanuski, I see your blue hand. Yeah, just this is relatively short, I hope, but um, I think the last stock assessment I went to on sable fish was in Seattle in 2018, but at that time, Talking to the uh, production people, they were getting all kinds of small sable fish. And John Fields was there. He may remember this, but I suggested that, you know, looking for, I guess, wouldn't be data you could use, except in a general way, qualitative, but uh, knowing, you know, the sizing that's coming off the boats and that kind of thing might have been something to indicate that uh, there was a population building and uh, and there was a lot of concern also in fishermen and the IFQ fishery where we're hoarding fish at times. I think that was more recent, but just in order to make sure that they had what they needed for bycatch. But I think there's certainly a source of information there that can be looked at. Uh, I don't know what it can utilize for, but uh, I guess if not in 2018, if I recall, and John can maybe correct me, but I, I think we were actually headed down on the curve as far as uh, what the sable fish biomass was. And, uh, but there seemed to be an indication that there was a, a building of uh, younger fish, and then not just out of one year, but several. So things like that, uh, and the same thing happened in Alaska too. There was a big 2020 uh, population explosion, if I remember right, after I think three or four 
good years and and it's way up there now. So anyway, just uh, food for thought, I guess. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, since this isn't a star panel, uh, Kelly, you're not responded to, or you're not required to uh, elaborate, but um, if you'd like to go ahead. I was just gonna comment on the lack of our ability to get information out of the Pacific Hake fishery on sablefish because Pacific Hake has a large data source that's updated quite regularly. And we try to use the information there in previous sablefish assessments to inform recruitment, but it's really difficult when you're trying to take data from a fishery that is actively trying to not catch the species you're interested in. And so, yes, there's some information there, but it's not like a survey. And so I more research needs to be done to try to see how to best include that. And we can include it, but it'll never be as informative as a full blown research survey is. Good. Thank you so much, Kelly. And thank you, Mike, for that comment. All right, uh, let's see. So it is 1145 and we are on time, um, which is a rare thing. Let's see, uh, Corey, did you wanna oh, sorry, have go a ahead with you. final comment? Why don't you have a final comment before we go to general public comment? Um, well, I was just going to see if we wanted to talk about, you know, we were planning on having, like you said earlier, till the September briefing book to really uh, get our thoughts in order here. But the council was is asking for something for June. I don't know if you're going to have any discussion about what we think we should highlight for June or not, and maybe maybe if Gway or Michelle had thoughts there on what what. Um, what we might just, you know, we don't have much time or we have a lot more time for September and put a lot better thought in, but what can we, what can we highlight for June? Just uh, if you want to spend a few minutes thinking there, I'm just going to raise that question. Okay. That's a good point. So, um, so for June, we have just been asked to provide an, uh, an update. I don't know what they mean by uh, not a full update. Um, <laughs> they they have a half an hour on their calendar for us, and I think that they will find themselves surprised at, um, you know, they, it would be I would be surprised if it were only half an hour. So, um, but uh, what Kit has proposed was um, that we just report on our discussion at this meeting. You know, we had the meeting, here's what we talked about. Um, we'll provide you more information in September. Sincerely yours, EWG. Um, but um, do other folks have any other sort of priorities for, we're not so the I think the advanced briefing book deadline is next week. And personally, I've always preferred that we get our ecosystem reports in for the advanced briefing book deadline so that advisory bodies can look at it. But this time around, we're not going to be asking the advisory bodies any new questions. Um, uh, So we can, and since this was sort of a surprise, I think we can give ourselves a break and maybe go to the supplemental deadline, which I think is in early June. But so conversation, EWG, what do you think? Uh, I know there's, I can see the chat bouncing in. Um, do we have things we particularly want to get in front of them for June that would be a problem if we didn't, if we waited until September? Yvonne, the only question I have on that topic is kind of what we started with yesterday of 
we have this list of species, right, where council discussion was maybe consider more than just the single pilot species. But we haven't really come, I don't know if we've come to a consensus on what can we do? How, you know, I'm not sure if that's part of this update. I'm very confused on what an update is. <laughs> so I think I'm just struggling there. But I know that based on the council discussion in March, it was kind of around the um, workshop as well as like potential workshops and timing, and then also species selection for this first kind of round of piloting. So not sure what we want to do about that. Okay, thanks. So yeah, so um, front loading the species selection criteria is um, maybe something that we could consider because I think, you know, there's a lot of interest in rolling ahead with the initiative as quickly as possible and forgetting that first we need to choose the species that we're, we're um, going to subject to the initiative for treatment. Um, so, okay, all right. Sorry, that's not a conclusion. It's more mulling. Um, and I'm doing the same thing, so no yeah. judgment there. <laughs> yeah. Quay uh, Kirchner, did you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, thanks, so. thanks, so, Yvonne. Um, I what what um and uh, part of the problem is the council never like writing these things down it becomes a lot more of like this is what i interpreted the council to say and so this is what i interpreted the council to say um it's a, one of the things they were looking for was you know the the good work that you all did here but then what is still needed to be done like, what would the team expect to achieve over the summer before September? What would need to be done after September to be able to inform the workshop development for later in the year? Okay, well, we are fortunate to have council member Lynn Matz weigh in in the chat. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. Um, I don't know if you want to provide any verbal guidance, but um, just an update and short discussion on possible workshops later in the year. Oh, okay. Thanks, Lynn. Okay. So just in writing. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, I guess on that, if, on Lynn and Gway's comment, I mean, if the... If... The point in my memory was kind of one of the point was to help the workshop process, the planning for that, what needs to be, what would be helpful to be known in June versus September, I guess I'm still not clear on, but and I'm also, you know, still mulling over thoughts about, that was a good word you all used. Um, yeah, what will happen in September? What will happen afterward? Are we going to need time for extra time outside of council meetings for people to to do more of what we tried to do here today and i i can totally see that happening because i'm still pretty fuzzy on 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 how this is all going to work but yeah i guess a long way to say i'm not i'm still not quite sure what would be helpful um it seems like workshops will be helpful at some point i don't know that i know we could pull it out i couldn't pull it out at this point what what exactly um we will know in june about what will need to happen after september not helpful but just you know articulating where my head is at the moment if we um if we can get a species selection criteria table draft to them by June. Could we, could the council potentially finalize that in September? And then could a workshop be useful in running through the species selection process for multiple species simultaneously?
Go ahead and jump in, anyone. Or anyone. Hey, Yvonne. Yeah, no, thanks. No, to your question of could we get a final species selection together by June, I think we could. Dr That's not your question, sorry. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I, I was thinking like a draft for June, and then the council could decide if they wanted to adapt a final in September. Like in June, the council would think about, well, do we want to adopt a final selection criteria table by September? And if they do, then we would aim for that. And then potentially after September, we could work on using that table. Okay, that, that sounds great and answers my other question, which is would we want to complete that table for species that have been mentioned in council discussion or by the advisory bodies by September. And it sounds like you're proposing that would happen after September. So the, the council would be approving the use of that kind of table by September, and then we would move forward with implement implementing it after that. Is that correct? Yeah, but I, you know, tempted by, you did some work um, on tweezing out species that have been chosen by different advisory bodies in the council. And so maybe we could we could pilot those species for September. I don't know. We'll have to we'll have to think about it. Yeah, just a quick reaction to that is I think that could be interesting, at least if we had some advisory bodies that were willing to engage on some draft evaluations of the species selection criteria so that we could do that co-development piece and see how that goes and provide some information to the council about whether that part's working. Um, but it might be a lot to imagine that each of the advisory bodies we might want will be available between now and September. Thank you. Yes, you're totally right. <laughs> Go ahead, Kiva. Uh, you mean like the ground fish management team might be a bit busy this summer? Um, <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, I, I think it's always nice to have like a concrete, you know, like it's fine and good to present these sort of like theoretical criteria, but I, I feel like actually seeing it applied and like where the rubber meets the road is going to, I think we'll get a lot more useful feedback if they actually see an application of the criteria rather than just seeing them sort of in their generic form. Thank you. That's a good point. It's always easier to be brave and throw something out there and have people, you know, throw vegetables at it. Um, go ahead, Jessica, then Corey. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it's useful for potentially the recommendation for September be like a finalized draft because there will be based on advisory body feedback edits potentially to that criteria that need to happen. So I wouldn't want to have council finalize it in September and then us come back and want to revise it again. And I do agree with Kiva that it might be nice for to have a species for each FMP that we kind of step it through maybe as an example so that it can initiate that discussion with those advisory bodies. And then that could be the basis of these workshops um, after September. Okay. Thank you. That's helpful, sort of lining up of the tasks. Go ahead, Corey. Yeah, I guess I'm less into the species selection process at this point than how we're going to actually use the risk tables themselves. And I don't know if Kit's being polite today because he's he's been one one on with our discussion, saying how are we actually going to what are we going to do with these things? Um, and I think a lot of people. Are going to be similar of a similar mind. Um, so I'm if in the in terms of needing dedicated time outside of a council meeting in a workshop type setting. And I'm wondering if that would be a better use of, of the time. Um, yeah, I just still think if we, we we finalize these, maybe in kit. Sorry, I don't mean to call you up, but I just I think we've given to people. It's still going to be what what do we do with this? You know, and like I've been saying, like where. Why is this going here instead of in the research and data needs? And um, yeah, to me, that's a more pressing type question than you really showing how this works for um, and acknowledging the possibility that might not fit our system before we start selecting other other species. Go ahead, Jessica. <clears throat> And Corey, then... I guess I just am a little bit like cart and horse situation here of how do we 
step through and have the time to develop an example to see how it would be implemented and then see where those pitfalls may be for other species, species complexes, FMPs. So I guess I agree that that's a really important component, what we're working towards. I'm just for this report in June, I'm not sure what tractable by September, like where we will be by September besides stepping through maybe one of those examples, let alone all of these different components. So that's where I kind of lean towards taking bite-sized pieces of this forward. Well, I think uh, we're going to have rest tables, right? By September drafts. Definitely. But like the process of stepping those through the completed process, maybe an individual workshop, but applying that then to other species or seeing how it would look for other species with different amounts of data, different management processes from different FMPs. I don't know. I just, there's a lot there besides just this developing the risk table. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, so, uh, it is noon and I don't want to eat up. We've, well, we've eaten up our public comment time. Um, and I see members of the public, uh, with their blue hands raised. So I think we'll just have to work out some of this, um, arguing with each other by email. Um, so Gway and then Michelle. Oh, thanks, Yvonne. I just wanted to say that this, I think you're having the, the exact conversation that at least I was hoping to hear about workshops. And I think all of the ideas are great. And just a reminder that I have funding for two workshops. Or I suppose I could put it together and make one like really big kick ass workshop, but really um, two workshops. So there could be like both of the ideas that have come up could could be done in workshops. Um, thanks, Yvonne. Okay, and thanks. so first of all, Go just want to thank you and the all the folks that joined on your meeting the last couple of days. So I um, really appreciate all the engagement by the stock assessment authors and the IEA team and EWG and everybody who participated. Um, I'm not sure what I was expecting, but this exceeded my expectations. So um, thanks for everyone coming together and having a really good discussion. Um, I really appreciate the presentations also by uh, Jamil, thinking ahead on the species selection criteria. I'll say um, I'm less focused on that right now as well. And I think that trying to prepare something for June, even as a draft uh, and for council consideration in September would be a bit um, cart before the horse. I think the council and stakeholders need to have a walkthrough of the risk tables that you'll be developing for September before they can really think about um, whether they want to have something similar done for other species and what the criteria would be um, to select which species they might want that in the future, want that for. So um, appreciate the, the discussion and just thinking ahead in what I envisioned would be prepared for June was um, more of just an informational update of here's where the EWG is in developing the risk tables for the September meeting, uh, what's left to be completed. Um, I think it would also be helpful to the council process if that included kind of the steps beyond the risk table. So maybe just kind of a bulleted list of what would be needed once the risk tables are um, presented to the council in September to then get to the objective of initiative four from the risk table. So kind of listing out the steps that would be needed for um, management consideration, in this case for petroli or sablefish, if that if the risk tables were to be carried forward and kind of what the sequencing is of those um, steps, what kind of what's left to do. Um, so thanks again, that's all I've got. Okay, 
Thanks, Michelle. I, I just, um, so I will say uh, that I was pretty stressed out when the council wanted a report in June, in addition to a report in September, because it seemed like they were wanting to have like, um, have us do more sooner than we were able to do. Um, and I definitely include in that, like lay out what are all the next steps. And um, so I guess I'm just gonna ask everyone on the call to temper their expectations um, for what's going to be yeah, provided thanks, Yvonne, in Yvonne, just to clarify, um, I'm not everything. proposing that you outline the Everywhere, next steps for your June report. Um, <laughs> just for the June report, like just a, a quick summary about what happened on the EWG meetings, kind of um, what the discussions were. Uh, but then just thinking ahead to like September and beyond, noting what those steps are. So I don't have a specific timeline for that, but it seems like um, that we don't really have a good collective understanding about how to get there from here and what's needed. Okay, thank you. Um, and then, so just for the EWG and for the public, I think that um, we are, circling around like the next public meeting of the EWG will be probably in the week prior to the September council meeting and it'll be an online meeting and we will be probably briefing the public and advisory bodies about wherever we are in the initiative process as part of that meeting and then sort of trying to develop our final reports for September. So we'll probably have um, advanced briefing book report for September and then a supplemental report with more information based on whatever we talk about in August. It's, it's a little fuzzy. Um, okay, uh, so are there any other members of the public who want to comment, provide information, share ideas with us. Okay. If you can't raise your blue hand, you can go ahead and speak up. Okay. Um, and then I will just say, and Kit, it might be announced on the website that the ecosystem advisory sub panel okay i'm going to put the link in the chat is scheduled to meet the morning of may 31st unfortunately i am already double booked that morning with other obligations uh, but if you want to attend they will be talking more about um the initiative and some of their ideas for where and how it should move forward. Okay, let's do a last call. Brilliant ideas, thoughts, wisdom to share. Okay, EWG, look out for a bunch of emails and uh, get ready to write. Thank you. Thanks everyone. See you soon. Hi, thank you.